Good evening, Brendan. Oliver Pritchard, how's it going? That was a, a new um, intro that no one told us about. It's all very it, short. It is very much. Um, yeah. As you can see, the, the dogs are present today. This is new co-presenter uh, Laika and co-presenter <laughs> Zoe is... Um, I don't know where she is. Oh, she's she disappeared. Is. Yeah, well, she, she can drift in and out. A few, a few um, cameo appearances, no doubt, um, from, uh, from... Oh, what, yeah, that'll be... Zoe, is it? Zoe is here, yeah. Oh, they've okay. decided to start fighting. Okay. Well, no, that's good. We can get, um, <laughs> as long as they don't make too much noise. Although there's probably more noise in this house uh, where I am right now. with <laughs> screaming children coming from the, yeah. the floor above me. But yeah, people might be wondering why we've got dogs on the show. But um, as Ollie will no doubt tell us when we get to this, it is a dog's life. Although not every dog will be as lucky to have such a caring, considerate owner as Mr. Pritchard. And what's more, some places are more dog friendly than others. This is what we'll be discussing on tonight's Bogger Tonight's Guide. It is Colombia's only live and interactive English language chat show, as you know now. Do you own a dog here? If so, do you find Bogota and Colombia in general to be a good place? have a canine companion on the other hand some might say dogs are given too much freedom here i'd never say that it is they who very much wag the tail that is colombia and act with more impunity than and it could be argued some former presidents wherever you mark your territory on all this whichever tree you're barking up we want to hear about it and any other better dog puns as well gladly received uh, send us comments about your doggy delights or canine frights right now by using the live message facility. Or if you're watching this recorded, you can still get involved by commenting on where you're viewing or via tweet, the handle being at Bogota Post with the hashtag Bogota Tonight. This show, remember guys, is all about viewer interaction. Whether that's a canine or a human or even a feline, we'll take all sorts of comments. Do get in touch with us. <laughs> even a feline. Right. Yeah, indeed. Uh, that uh, doggy chat is to come in the second half of the show, but it's our news and sports review first. And for the second week in a row, we'll start with the latter. Ollie, an away win in Lima against Peru and a comeback draw at home against Argentina. Not a bad few days for La Selección de Colombia in the race for Qatar 2022, uh, was it? No, not really. Um, I mean, look, Argent I think before the match, you'd always say that. Um, I think you'd always say that a point, you know, from Argentina is is a good result. Um, so I think they would have taken that, you know, the day before. There's a lot to be said. I mean, yes, a comeback victory is is obviously a positive thing. But on the other hand, you know, you could maybe say they shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. Personally, I'd say it shows great strength of character to come back. I'd say more positives than negatives for sure. And, you know, at the end of the day, four points on the board. People are dropping points left, right and centre. Puts Colombia in a stronger position, I think. Well, in fairness, OK, take the two games together. Uh, I think if you'd said to uh, Reynaldo Rueda, the, the new Colombian DT, as they say here, the uh, head coach, if you'd said to him at the start, we give you four points and you don't have to play a game, I think he'd, uh, he'd, he'd snap the offer off you, in fairness. Um, yeah, definitely, exactly, how, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, even if it was the reverse, a draw in Lima and, uh, and, and, and a win over Argentina, which obviously would have been a bigger confidence boost, I guess, going forward. But it's so topsy-turvy. We were talking about this. Like, Peru lose this day last week. Uh, Colombia, I think, just, just as we were about to finish the show, went 1-0 up. They ended up winning 3-0, as we know. But then Peru go to Quito and win 2-1, and Ecuador were flying high until then, really. So... Yeah, it's so topsy-turvy. You take Brazil out of it. No one's catching Brazil by the looks of things. They're on, uh, what, six six games, uh, six wins. Uh, okay, yeah. they haven't played Argentina. That's to come. But like, really, when you take the rest, or take Brazil out of it, the rest of it, it's okay. Argentina's maybe a, kind of a little bit ahead of the rest. But outside of that, like as things stand, Colombia in fifth place. So they're in the, as they would say here, repache, the playoff position which is nearly a guarantee into the World Cup because it's usually, I think, 
like against the Australian, uh, that, that, that yeah, side Oceana, of the world. Which, yeah. Oceana, that's it, yeah. Um, so, so like, yeah, you have to say, like, considering their last few games under, obviously, Carlos Queiroz, but there certainly seems a fighting uh, spirit in this team now. And you could ask, um, you know, who cares about James Rodriguez right now? Yeah, I mean, they look comfortable without him. I mean, you know, um, look, he's obviously, you know, he's a player with a great deal of quality. I think there's two things about leaving Hamas out. One is that, you know, obviously he's potentially not fit and he would be, be, be a bit of a drag on the team. But I also wonder if there's an element to this which kind of says, well, actually, on a man management point, it's good to tell him and to tell the other players as well, look, you've got to earn your place um, uh, in the team. There's, there's nothing being handed out for free. So in that, in that respect, I think, yeah, this is a very successful um you know, uh, World Cup qualifying uh, uh, round. Now, whether or not the Copa America will be as successful, that's a bit of a different story. I have to say, I wonder if it would have been a good idea to have him at least in the squad, thinking, well, you know, he can play himself back in as, uh, into fitness. He's a useful person to have coming off the bench. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I lost you a little bit there, oh, I'm not sure. Sorry. If it's the connection this side or your side but um yeah that's interesting that he's not in the squad at all but i guess he might be kind of on speed dial in case he is required or whatever i mean it is only what a, a four or five hour flight away to, down to brazil if if uh, his services are required i have to say you know not that this is james watch although kind of in our earlier shows we used to have a james watch when he, when he made his uh, move to everton but he's been posting a lot on social media as if to kind of project this image that he doesn't well not that he doesn't care because he did say like all the best to the to the selection ahead of the peru game and said like you know always with la selection but then he was posting photos having what looked like a, a whiskey anyway with um carlos vives and, and some other uh, famous colombian who, whose name escapes me right now but you know so he's been enjoying himself uh, back home in the homeland anyway but uh it, it is uh, it's true what you say though in terms of going into the into the Copa America, like, I wonder how much the players in each individual national team really want this. It's almost like it's been forced upon them in many ways. Yeah, it's got vibes of uh, Tokyo, hasn't it? The Olympics in a very similar situation. You, you do start to wonder, you know, if this is being done for the sponsors and Conmebol or whether it's being done for, you know, sporting interest. I mean, let's not forget, Brendan, it's not like we've had a shortage of Copper Americas recently. In fact, quite the opposite, you know. There's been Copper Americas every five seconds, you know. Uh, <laughs> seemingly every every two years, there seems to be another one. And, and look, it's just, it's getting a bit crazy. And, you know, now the sponsors are starting to pull out is Brazil a good choice? You know, if you're worried about COVID in Argentina, oh, that's fine, let's go to Brazil. You know, it's, it seems odd. It just, and, and especially with the season that many of the players have just had, you know, they've got a, a winter World Cup coming up in a, a year, year and a half. It just seems like a weird decision. Yeah, I, I, okay, as you said, I think like um, Commonwealth might have been looking for the money out of this, TV rights and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I don't think too many people would lose sleep over it. Like certainly the vibe I'm getting now, obviously <laughs> I don't speak for the whole of Colombia, but I don't see a huge amount of interest that on Sunday Colombia plays Ecuador in, in their first game in the Copa America and indeed next week when we're on uh, they'll have just played uh, venezuela you know so two big games come well they're always big games in this stuff i mean that they're always kind of neighbors you're playing anyway but that just doesn't seem now maybe it'll be different once the tournament gets underway and people see it underway on on sunday uh, and that it actually does start after all the kind of will it won't it talk but i don't know about the vibe your end uh, like maybe you know better football men than i do but maybe there is I've got to be honest, I, I think it's the same. I, I think there's a lot of jadedness 
you know, in, in terms of yet another Copa America, it just doesn't feel special. Now that will change if Colombia, let's say, get to a semi-final. I'm sure that will change. Oh, of course, yeah. If they get winning a, a whiff of winning it, then yes, then then, then there's something big at at, at, uh, at stake, obviously. Um, well, we 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 watched this space, and it was as we said this time next week. Columbia will uh, will have already played their second game, so we'll have an indication of how how they're going or otherwise. Just to mention, though, of course, um, at Tuesday's game, we saw fans at the stadium in, in Barranquilla, um, and we also had a game today, Juniors Millonarios, the semi-finals have now recommenced, which is a sign, and I know we're going to get to this shortly in our news review in terms of protests and what's been happening and what hasn't been happening, but these semi-finals of the Liga Betplay, formerly Liga Aguila, I preferred it when it was Aguila, I have to say, but anyway. And um, the one before that. Of course, there you go, yeah, they were going through the, the drinks companies. But, um, <laughs> um, like... The, the, these were on, on hold until the kind of situation returned to normal. So is this an indication that everybody kind of now believes that, yeah, things are going back to normal? Although things didn't pass off without incidents in Barranquilla uh, on Tuesday, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, a friend of the paper uh, was there sort of covering the match um, and got caught up in a lot of the violence. He popped along to see the protests uh, you know, a block away from the sta uh, stadium, lots of people there. Uh, police moved in uh, as usual to try and get rid of them just before the game kicked off. And um, yeah, things went a bit high haywire. People throwing rocks, SMAD firing tear gas, the SMAD tank rolling in. You know, the usual chaos. And again, that seems to be something that uh, more or less went under the radar by the main Colombian media. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, it seen doesn't seem to... Yeah, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, look, one of the problems with the uh, uh, Copa America taking place in Colombia would have been that idea of, you know, protests potentially being an ugly thing picked up by cameras. This certainly wasn't picked up by any of the cameras. It was reported in the news, but it, it wasn't on the TV broadcasts. And, yeah, you know. Well, sad. I did see, yeah, RSN's coverage today, and they were talking about ahead of the juniors uh, Millonarios game, you know, about maintaining uh, law and order uh, outside the stadium. Uh, so obviously they were alluding to what happened on Tuesday, but there were, there were no pictures. Now, I don't know how things passed off this afternoon. It was a four o'clock kickoff. Finished, by the way, Junior said, did win 3-2. So the return leg is on Sunday. Actually, Sunday's going to be a bit of a, a feast of football. Um, we might as well mention, of course, exactly at, what, eight o'clock in the morning um, for you guys? It's early, yeah. yeah. Um, and then at 1.30, you've got uh, the return leg, Millonarios Junior, here in El Campín. And then, of course, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, I think it's a, a 4, 4 p.m. kickoff. So those of you who have been missing live football, um, well, you're certainly going to enjoy, enjoy what's coming up on Sunday. Uh, and by the way, just to mention what I'm talking about, that Talima Equidad finished 1-1 as well. So we had two two games. Uh, the return leg of that Talima Equidad in uh, Equidad is uh, is Monday, bank holiday. Monday, we've got another bank holiday. And that's, that, that's, of course, Bogota's third team. Yes, the kind of feeder team in many ways. Lovely jersey. I've always said it, I want to get that jersey, but it's very difficult to get... Chiviada, as they say here, a fake Ekira jersey. You, know, you have to buy the original, which I've really no intention of forking out 250000 for a for a jersey. But uh, if anyone knows where, where I can get hold of a, a genuine Ekira <laughs> jersey, do let, it, do let me know. Uh, the green, obviously, as an Irishman, I kind of like it. It's a nice, strong green <laughs> as well. Uh, by the way, Ali, while we're just talking about it, we mentioned England and Croatia. Of course, the Euros kicking off this weekend or tomorrow, to be honest. Bit of a strange yeah, Euro, the format. You yeah. looking forward? You're looking forward to the Irish matches, are you? Um, well, if, if by Irish, uh, if by Irish you mean Scottish, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
our, our, our Celtic cousins and Wales, of course, as well, are in it. But just to be in, in passing, just in case uh, people want to know in Bogota, I've, I've seen on some of the social media that El Inglés is a pub uh, well known around the kind of Chapinero area, is it? Um, uh, but, Quinta uh, Paredes. Okay. Like 60, 60 or 70 something, is it? Yeah. Quinta Paredes. Quinta Camacho. Quinta Camacho. Quinta Camacho, sorry. yeah. Will you go there or are you into that kind of to go and watch a game with? Maybe. Possibly. Um, I have to say, watching England play football with uh, English people can. Sometimes it's fun. Um, not always. Do you do you kind of have um, gumptions to take off your top and, and just start shouting loudly? Yeah, no, not, not, not a big fan of that sort of thing. I'm a little bit worried as well, Brenda. I mean, it's always at the moment the big thing for us, of course, is trying to work out if people are going to do uh, players taking the knee. Um, that'll be uncomfortable. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Don't know what to do there. I'm well, you did sure. mention, yeah, well, uh, not to go down down that route of a conversation, but I will say Ireland, uh, the Republic of Ireland, did play Hungary in a, in a friendly on Tuesday and in Budapest. And maybe unsurprisingly, when the Irish players did take the knee, there were boos around the stadium. And I see yeah. the Hungarian president came out saying, well, what to expect? Uh, and that Hungary never had slavery. I thought, well, I'll have to check that one. There was never slavery in Hungary? Sure. Yeah, no. Um the, the Hungarian Prime Minister, of course, is uh, a particularly odious um, uh, uh, piece of work, Orban. Um, yeah, no, not, not ideal. And of course, I mean, you know, you're thinking of Ireland, you're thinking of um, people like Paul McGrath, um, you know, not on. Not on in 2021. Well, and even now, uh, like on that Irish team, there are a number of players of Nigerian descent as well. And I think they're probably going to be the backbone of, of any potentially successful Republic of Ireland team in years to come. But anyway, we're kind of getting uh, sidetracked on that. We mentioned protests in Barranquilla outside the game, uh, Colombia, Argentina on Tuesday. We were kind of all kind of holding our breath for Wednesday, Ollie, uh, yesterday this great Toma, the takeover of Bogota, so it seems by the, the strike committee, uh, that this was maybe going to be one of the big, bigger uh, moments in, this, in the strike that we've had since the 20th of April. In the end, not much to write home about, though. No, a few thousand people going down to the hotel Tekendama, you know, looking for bracelets to steal or whatever. That's a deep reference for football there for anyone who's uh, aware of that reference um yeah no not much going on a little bit of action up at Eroes, and of course the the strike um leaders have said this morning um that they're giving up on the idea of marches they're looking for a new direction to take protests in so who knows where that's going and of course who knows if anyone will listen to them just because they say that's what's happening now it's an interesting thing a lot of people are not there because of the strike committee there, there's a lot of factors behind this and they definitely don't speak for all the protesters however it is noticeable that when they they have a really good organizing system and they're able to organize a lot of people to get out you know bodies on the on the street so It'll be interesting to see what happens, whether or not there are wildcat protests that continue, or whether without that kind of organising base, it, it starts to crumble a bit. Hard to say. Just on that, um, Ollie, it seems interesting. Are we kind of talking a Gandhi-esque civil disobedience then? Is that what they're kind of moving here? Of, uh, like I don't refusal? Know. Yeah. Mm, what would be interesting to see. Of course, mentioning why the... the strikers went down to hotel um taken down is because we had representatives from the um international court of human rights they're in the country for a couple of days and they're going to be visiting well here in bogota obviously papajan and, and cali i believe are the, the three centers they're going to be focused on um so members of this uh, strike committee did meet with them protesters did meet with them and also um our beloved mayor um uh, claudia lopez uh, i saw was with them today so obviously that's showing that the international element and dimension to this and that you know people aren't completely turning a blind eye which some people will tell you they are but i mean 
people are keeping an eye on what's on what's happening here. But I mean, do you expect anything to come out of this visit, or is it no. more symbolic? No. The, the the only thing that will come out of this is that if the government want to change tack, they'll say they'll be able to say, "Look, we're following the advice of the uh, International Court of Human Rights." But, but in terms of it, look, it'll be as influential as it is in any other country, which is to say, not at all. Uh, you know. Human rights organizations have complained about actions all over the world. They don't stop. You know, they, they, they say that it's not on what's happening in China. That's being ignored. They say it's not on what's happening in Tigray, in Ethiopia. They're being ignored there. They're being ignored in Mali, in Palestine, very obviously. Um, there's no reason to suggest. I, I, I suspect, look, it comes down to this. If Duque thinks that there's a public mandate for change from the Colombian people, then he'll go for it. But what the international community has to say about it, I just don't think is a factor, to be honest. Yeah, uh, well, and as we've talked before about Duque as well, is he just a, a lame duck president at this stage? He might be just hoping to limp his way to... Uh, Sorry, yeah, I mean, I should make that clear as well. He might think as well, Okay, there's not enough people asking for this. I can get away with not doing it. But but this idea that he'll be guided by international opinion or that he'll be guided by some sort of morality, that seems fancy, I think. Okay. Well, look, guys, um, do let us know if your dog owner is uh, watching this. If you're wondering why Ali's got his two chairs uh, outside in the, in the picture here, it's because um, he's got his two dogs, and we're going to be talking about owning dogs in Bogota. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. Is it a dog-friendly city? Is Colombia a dog-friendly country? Some would say it is. Others would say it's not. We want to hear your thoughts. Do send them to us right now. We'll take them on uh, on any comments as well that we're talking about here, whether you want to talk about the football, these ongoing protests, where you see them going. Are they now finally petering out? Uh, is that what it looks like? And, of course, we had Ollie. Uh, what I'm calling a great reopening in Bogota on Tuesday, although I'm not really sure what it means. Um, were there massive changes down your neck of the woods? Because there certainly weren't. Well, I, was, I was thinking about that this morning, actually. Um, you know, I was out running with the dogs this morning. It felt like there were more buses and more people on the buses. And, you know, in the afternoon, I was walking the dogs again. Up on September again, there seem to be more buses again, more people in the buses again. I haven't seen packed buses for a while. Um, today there seems to be a few more. Uh, maybe I'm just imagining it. I mean, certainly around, you know, actually in this zone, no change at all, it would appear. Absolutely none whatsoever. Yeah, the only thing today, and again, I can't really just, you know, use one day as a reference point, but... The, the traffic going south on the on the autopista norte, so heading into the centre, was very heavy this morning. I haven't seen it as heavy for quite some time. Now, I'm comparing that to yesterday when there was practically nothing, but of course that was probably because people were going, ah, there's a strike day, let's, let's avoid the city or whatever, uh, even though it didn't transpire. But um, yeah, it, it is difficult to know because as I've been saying here for weeks, um, like around this barrio, it's been pretty much business as usual. The, the only real difference I've noticed now is that a, a couple of the, the tiendas on kind of the main avenue, if I can call it that, going into my barrio, even though it's a, it's a, it's a cul-de-sac barrio as it is, but the main street that the police would always drive down when they're, when they're doing their rounds, a few tiendas have now opened, the tiendas where you can sit in and have a few drinks that had been closed or just doing uh, takeaways. So... That's really the only difference I can notice, because still, schools uh, remain phased closed. Re phased reopening is on its way. Okay. Um, and it does, it, it seems like, you know, things are, you know, sort of uh, plowing ahead, which again, seems mental. We had record cases again today. We had record deaths again uh, today. We're, we're touch. We're going to, I mean, the way things are going, Brendan, we're going to see our first uh, 600 day, uh, 600 death day fairly soon, maybe even 700, you know, 
We'll see. Uh, yeah, and I saw that in Cali. Now, I'm not sure if Cali has gone into the reopening phase with all the issues they've been having there, but like they, they've gone to the stage, which I think happened in other cities uh, previously, of like now choosing who gets those um, intensive care unit beds. Um, mm. Because they just don't don't have enough, so it, it does seem you know. I, again, I know we're repeating ourselves. We talked about this in previous weeks, but it's just a case where the authorities have kind of gone. Well, okay, guys, it's in your hands now. You, we've given you the measures to follow the protocols, uh, the various guidelines. Follow them, and and we'll see see what happens. Now, um, Ali, well, I just see Angela's in there. Um, well, it wouldn't be a show without Angela writing in with a comment. Thanks for that. Um, but um, as she says, an epidemi epidemiologist, easy for me to say that one, uh, said yesterday it's the whatever phase. And, and it does seem it's like whatever. But whatever happens, guys, yeah. we, we'll go with it. Um, I was going to say, though, have you found out any more information? Are you a step closer yeah. to getting a vaccine? Yeah. Should you? So, yeah. Okay. So what my university has officially said is that um, we're expecting on June the 15th, that group three, which is includes teachers, uh, group three is going to start their vaccination, uh, and we need to be alert for information. So we'll see what happens. I'm personally not going to be rushing to get a vaccine. Um, the reasons for that are that I've had COVID. I'm unlikely to get it again. Uh, I won't be doing presential classes for another six months or so. This, you know, I would much rather let the people who probably need the vaccine more than me get ahead of me in the queue uh, and then when things have calmed down a bit take my place in that queue okay and just uh, i was reading on blue radio there have been some slight changes to this stage three apparently if you're pregnant uh from i think it's from nine weeks to within so if you're nine weeks from nine weeks pregnant to within 40 days of giving birth you're now uh, in line to get it to get a vaccine. I'll, get I'll shock you, Brendan. I'll shock you. I don't think I'm pregnant. All oh, right. right. Well, I, I'm waiting for the results of a, of a test to see where I fall in that one. Or if you happen to have a child who's under 12 with comorbidities uh, as well, they're also included in this uh, phase of the uh, of the, the, the vaccine rollout. And Giselle has been in. Uh, Giselle, you are um, preempting us with the doggiest. Of course, we are going to be talking about dogs. So hold your dog puns and your dog comments until about two minutes' time when we'll be getting, uh, we'll be racing into that uh, as, as, as a greyhound would at a time. See, I'm trying to think of a dog pun on the, on, on, on the, on the spot here. But um, yeah, teachers getting them. And actually, a friend of mine who's a teacher in a private school in Kahika, I got her uh, vaccine on Saturday and uh, had a violent reaction, but it just seems completely coincidental. She got the vaccine, but now she's tested positive for <laughs> COVID. So, yeah, rather, rather strange that one, because uh, she was blaming the vaccine initially, but it just seems she's got COVID and the vaccine obviously didn't have time to, uh, to kick in. Uh, now, Ali, I know you're eager to get to our doggy chat, um, but will we will we mention speaking of dogs, uh, <laughs> Penalosa, the former mayor, has been in the news. Um, yeah, well, he's he's Peñalosa. the former mayor that famously didn't punch my dogs, um, <laughs> which you know seems like a low bar. But um, anyway, yes, uh, Enrique Penalosa casting his. Uh, his his hat into the ring for the presidency again, except it's not clear who he's going to be representing. Now, the advantage here, Brendan, is that Enrique Peñalosa has represented so many political parties now that truly nobody, nobody else in Colombia can claim to know the political landscape as well as he does. Um, I think pretty much the only people he hasn't represented seem to be uh, the FARC and the Senators. Apart well, he's been all over. So, sorry now, Ali. Come on, get 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 with the times. It's not FARC anymore. What is it? Um, Comuneros. Oh, sorry, yes. Comuneros. Yes. Yeah, yes. Comuneros. Yes. Very good. 
And, and I see uh, uh, what I saw, I should say, a headline today in El Tiempo where, where he said he hasn't been in talks with Centro Democratico. That, well, Peñalosa is just kind of lining them up. It's almost like he's kind of going blindfolded in and I'll go, whichever one comes out and, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, it seemed odd. He said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the politician with the, the greatest coherence, which, you know, it's almost a laughable kind of Orwellian way to describe himself. You know, he, he's flip-flopped his way through Colombian politics from, you know, party to party party without any sort of guiding principle. And and it seems just odd. I mean, look, Brendan, the thing I found most odd about that is that he chose to open by saying, look, it's not just Petro against everybody else, you know. And I thought, yeah, I don't think people were saying that particularly until you walked in to say that. It seems to me really passive defensive to start off complaining about somebody dominating, uh, you know, the political... Uh, atmosphere by yourself mentioning that same person. Bizarre. Yeah. Everything yeah. about it is bizarre. Well, well, we laugh now, Ollie, but I'm telling you, this time next year, maybe maybe we're looking at Enrique Peñalosa in a, in a second round run off. Don't rule he it looks out. Like, he looks like a carved wooden voodoo model of a badly remembered fish cartoon. That's what he looks like. I don't. Do you want him leaving your country? Uh, Ali Pritchard, I'm not a fan of Enrique Peñalosa. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hold my judgment for the moment. <laughs> um, and Giselle is saying, Brendan, don't curse us. Sorry, yeah, I know you've got enough problems already. I'm just saying, don't rule anything in or out at this stage. By the way, just to really finish up on the like final point on the vaccine stuff, and I know Angela's been on about people who've got COVID after they've got the vaccine, and um, the regular flu thing that um, Giselle is saying about Sinovac and Johnson. Got an email, strange email from the Irish embassy here. Apparently the French embassy will have a number of limited Janssen uh, vaccines to distribute to EU residents. So uh, if you know any, of course, Holly, this rules you out now. But uh, if we do have any continentals or other Irish people who haven't got this email, uh, but it's for the over 55 age group and it's on a first come, first served basis. So um, if you know of anybody uh, who's from Europe, uh, in the European Union specifically speaking, and is over 55 and may want uh, a free vaccine, uh, get in Presum touch with the French. Pre pre presumably, I mean, I'm not being sarcastic here, presumably that doesn't apply to the Swiss. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm guessing not. Well, it, says, it says in this EU uh, residence. So uh, okay. I guess EU passport holders, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not yeah, an I, EU I resident. So sometimes they kind of lump in Norway and uh, and Switzerland, don't they? Anyway, yeah, yeah, unlikely yeah. to lump in the UK the way things are going these no. days in the talks. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, if, if people know uh, of EU citizens over fifty-five and uh, wanting a vaccine and haven't got one here, uh, that's a route to go. Check out the French embassy. Uh, right, guys, let's let's change tack here. Let's bring it to another level. Let's. Let's go to the, let's go canine for for the next half an hour or so or 27 minutes as it is and guys it'll probably come as no surprise to you i am not a dog owner in this city now i did grow up on a farm in the west of ireland and i'm well accustomed to uh, having dogs i did have dogs as pets although they generally stayed outside not in the house because that's in the countryside but oliver printer as you can tell has two wonderful looking siberian uh, I was going to say Siberian tigers. Oh, that came into my head. So they are Siberian. Well, they're, 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 definitely, they're definitely not tigers. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, Zoe. She's trying to sleep. So um, oh, I don't think she's wow. appreciating being poked at a camera. There she is. Uh, turn around and say hello. There you go. Good girl. And Laika <laughs> has gone and um, I think she's sleeping on the bed, but perhaps sulking because Zoe's getting attention. But yeah, the two of them, both adopted, by the way, um, before people, people often sort of say to me, I, I quite often people will say to me something like, um, oh, it's all very nice and well, you with your pedigree dogs, but personally, I prefer to adopt. And I go, yeah, no, they're, they're both adopted, actually, but, you know, thanks for the judgment. And, and are they, they one of the pedigree? Sorry. 
I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Okay. I mean, again, Brendan, they were both, you know, abandoned. So, <laughs> I mean, we didn't really get much of a chance to 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 ask that sort of question. Um, we do have a little bit of information. They've also both got their tattoos, by the way, which is another thing that people often ask me. Uh, now, can you explain to the uh, uninitiated what you mean by they've got tattoos? So, and I was hoping they, they just turned the wrong way. I'm sorry, I can't do anything about this. But um, inside their ear, I don't know if you can quite see that. Um, uh, I was just going to say, Ollie, th this worked so well in rehearsal. They were so obedient. <laughs> <Now they're... laughs> but, um, yeah, no, in, um, in the inside of their ear, they, they put a little tattoo uh, to mark that they've been sterilized, which I think is a fantastic idea. Um, so, yeah, my dogs have more tattoos than I do. Okay, and when you talked about um, uh, adopting them, like where did you go? You just found them, or uh, how, how did it work? Well, yeah. So um, on Facebook, one of my friends uh, shared uh, an advertisement for a, a missing uh, for a, for a husky with a foundation. Uh, so I rang up the foundation. Uh, and the foundation, you know, we went through the due process, and, um, and that, that was uh, that was like her. She arrived with me after a process of about four weeks. Um, uh, she arrived in the house, and that was nice. And then we had a couple more visits, um, and then she stayed with me. Um, and Zoe was a bit more complicated. So by that point, I was a member of lots of Siberian Husky groups on Facebook. And I was vaguely thinking about, you know, having two dogs because two is probably half the hassle. Actually, I, I definitely say it is now rather than double the trouble. Um, and that's where Zoe, this one here, um, her dog walker um, was just left with her. The family just said, hey, we're leaving Bogota. And amazingly, Brendan, I, I can't remember exactly where it was, but it, it's one of the Cundinamarca towns, you know, Cota, Chia. And they couldn't take the dog with them. You imagine that. I mean, I try not to judge too much. I don't know what the situation was in their life. They may have lost a job. They may have been moving to a smaller building. I, I, who knows? Um but yeah, it does seem a bit odd to be moving out of Bogota and, and have to give up a dog uh, yeah, for that yeah, reason. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so uh, that, that was kind of a private uh, adoption. Okay, well, interestingly, you mentioned that about like having to give up the dog. And I mean, I'll say that one of the reasons, but I can't say it's the, the strongest reason why I don't have a dog, although it would be a reason right now at this moment in time in my life, is that I would just going, well, I, I don't have the money. Like, how much would you spend on average here in Bogota to, to feed your dogs? Um, let's see. Um, we're probably going at about 250,000 for relatively good pepitos so the dry food um, that's around 250,000 for a sack which feeds both dogs uh, for a month give or take take or give um, you can of course you could buy much cheaper dog food and you could buy much more expensive dog food especially if you had to deal with sort of uh, kidney problems or something like that those those foods can be very expensive dog walkers I don't usually use but if I've got a heavy day and I'm going to be out or I'm going to be on the computer for the whole day you know when we've got exams in the university things like that um, it's 50,000 for both dogs uh, picked up at seven o'clock brought back at five o'clock um, so yeah that's definitely not expensive um, Kenneling them, I, I don't really put them in kennels, but um, the people they stay with when when I go away, it's got to be it's around a hundred thousand, I think, a day for the again for the two dogs. I haven't done that in a while. Obviously, I haven't left Bogota in in a year and a half. Um, so yeah, no, it's it's not actually that expensive. And and you'd have to say, Brendan, vet uh, veterinary costs here are very low. Uh, similar to medical costs for humans. Um, dog drugs are expensive. I'll tell you that much. Not cheap to drug them. Um, uh, when, when, it, when are you drugging them? Well, what, what's that for? Yeah, well, Brendan, some of us, 
who are hiding in the bedroom uh, have decided to eat bees before. And you know, oh. and actually eating a bee wasn't a really big problem. Um, that just made her nose swell up, you know, which is actually very cute. If you've ever, I, I recommend to everyone, Google dogs that ate bees. Great pictures. It'll have you laughing for ages. They, they're, they're, okay. Their nose all smells up. But the problem was, um, she then started scratching her nose with her claws um, and very rapidly drew blood. Uh, and that was much more problematic. So uh, we had to go and get um, antibiotics and we had to get, um, you know, anti-swelling uh, drugs. The problem is, Brendan, uh, people make things like, um, oh, what's it called? Um, you know, the, the basic sort of blood thinning drug that people take as a minor painkiller. Um, oh, you know, what it, anyway, um, it, look, you know, things like aspirin, for example, look, they're, they're widely available for humans because there are billions of humans in the world and they all want to take aspirin all the time for hangovers. But with dogs, it's a bloody nightmare because there are just not as many dogs looking to take aspirin. So the, the production qualities are much smaller. They've got to be much more divisible because there are so many different sizes of dog. It's not pleasant, really. Okay. Not pleasant. Okay. Uh, about 100,000 was the last I paid for minor painkillers. 100,000 pesos for a few pills. Would have cost, if, if that was human drugs, you know, DOS mill? Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the, on the few occasions that I've, I've bought tablets here because I don't tend to take medication if I can, if I can uh, avoid no, I'd it. I'd also like to, to highlight here, uh, Angela's saying poor things. I have less sympathy. My, my general thing is if you walk around trying to eat everything that moves and constantly uh, biting at bees and butterflies and that sort of thing, yeah, you know, frankly, limited sympathy from my side. Well, that's, that's kind of being a dog, though, isn't it? That's what they do. I have a problem, yes. Yeah, I have a problem. Yeah, it is right. part of being a dog, yeah. That is very yeah. true. By the way, I have to ask, though, because, you know, other people might be thinking about this. So you talked about kenneling. And, and, okay, you haven't traveled for a year and a half, but that's not just because of the dogs, but because, obviously, uh, more is the point that the pandemic. But do you think you may have traveled maybe around Christmas time if you didn't have dogs? I mean, I know it's, it's a big hypothetical question, but, but because it's a hassle now. Well, I know you don't see it as yeah, a hassle, in a sense. But, it, it, yeah. No, no, it's definitely it's, it's an extra cost, and, and it is an extra hassle. You're quite correct. Um, it is an extra thing to think about, because actually there's quite a lot to it. It's not just um, they can go in a kennel. It's, okay, first I have to check that the house that I normally leave them with um, is you know has space and can deal with it. Um, if those girls don't have space for them, then it, you know, I'd probably offer them to friends actually first. I'd, I'd say, I'd say, look, does somebody want to come and live in my house for, um, uh, for a few days while I go away? That, that would be my next offer. I'd be very reticent, Brendan. Um, I'd certainly want at least one recommendation, um, before putting my dogs in a kennel. And the simple reason is for that. Look, I see on dog groups on Facebook day after day that somebody sort of posts a video of maltreatment, um, you know, at, at a dog kenneling place. Um, I see lots of the dog walkers here. The reason I use the dog walkers that I use is because I know them from walking my dogs. I've seen them out walking, you know, their client dogs when I'm walking my dogs. And um, you know, I know them to be really, really conscientious and hardworking people. Not always the most professional. Uh, they quite often turn up late or arrive back late and that sort of thing. Um, but excellent with the dogs and the dogs love them. And that's really the key thing. And that, that's why I think where, where things do get a bit trickier here than say in England. Like, in England, I think I would probably have a little bit more confidence with uh, the ability of animal rights people to check um, 
uh, to check conditions and to check that things are operating as normal. Like I say, literally every day in the park, I'll see somebody with frankly a dangerous number of dogs. You know, there'll be a guy out walking 10, 15 large dogs. Yeah, you know, I, I've, they I've be seen that as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, by the way, now I, I have to say, I did cat sit uh, once in this city. So I, my friend got me to stay in her apartment while she was in Germany for five weeks and look after a cat. But a cat is, uh, well, it's not as much work as a dog, really. I didn't have to bring the cat for walks or anything like that. So it didn't really, just to make sure it had enough food and water, that was it. And, and cleaned its, um, its litter thing. Uh, that was it. That, that's true. And my, my expenses would be a lot more um, if I wasn't the primary uh, walker of my dogs. And, you know, look, one of the reasons I have dogs, I'll be honest about it, one of the reasons I have uh, huskies especially, but dogs in general, is I enjoy walking. I enjoy walking around. Oh, you've fallen off the sofa. Where are you going? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, um, I, I enjoy walking. I like walking around um, and I enjoy walking dogs and I enjoy throwing sticks and that sort of thing. Um, and that, that really does make a difference. Again, I, I'm very fortunate. I live two, three hundred yards from the, well, a bit more than that, less, less than a kilometre from the Parque Nacional. So we go there, you know, literally every day. Um, so that's that's a big help. Okay. Uh, by the way, Giselle just saying that a, a friend's dogs were uh, lost for a week when they were being transported to a kennel. Well, I, I, I take it from how you've written that, that they were found again, which I guess is, is one good thing, but uh, it doesn't seem great. Oh, we lost your dogs there for a week. Great. That was yeah, wonderful. it's not ideal, is it? No. Um, <laughs> by the way, when you, you were talking about bringing them to Parque Nacional, so do you take them off the leash? then when, when they're up there, like, yeah, no issues. Yeah, great, great question. So um, I'm a conscientious uh, lead owner, but you know, actually, Brendan, this weekend, I think it was Sunday, um, I actually went up to a Husky owner in the park um, and said, you know, hey, look, I think it's great um, that you've got your dog on a lead. It was obviously a young Husky, he was obviously worried about it running away or causing trouble, uh, and, he, and he'd taken steps to deal with that. And, and you look, people often hear, people often say uh, that they think I'm being cruel by keeping my dogs uh, on their leads in the local parks. You know, I'm talking about the little parks, you know, where you've just got a little bit of grass and then there's roads all around. And I don't let my dogs off leash there. Um, and the reason I don't is because I've seen dogs get hit by cars, nearly hit by cars. You know, dogs chase cats. When I was young, one of our spaniels uh, ripped a cat in half. Um, you know, there are good reasons to keep them on the leash in sort of big built up areas. The septum is just up there. The tracer is just down there. It's just it's a risk I don't want to take, frankly, um, not. To mention, I think we've lost Brendan there. Uh, not to mention the um, quantity uh, of, of kind of bones and crap all around the place. And when I say crap, I, I really do mean um, uh, crap, literally, uh, in some cases. So it's not always um, it's not always easy. I, I, I think um, thinking about leashes, um, but I, I think it's very important because. Um, I, I think it's irresponsible, frankly. There are many people in this city who perhaps uh, are scared of dogs, who don't want dogs running around at them, that might be worried that dogs are going to attack them. Something Brendan and I have talked about is a weird coincidence. Um, he was attacked by a dog fairly recently. Um, and I've been attacked um, I've been attacked by uh, a dog, not in Bogota. This was in um, Hardin, Antioquia. But, uh, you know, I have scars on my leg here um, uh, from dog bites. So I can understand it. And, and actually, I find when I'm out and about, especially parents will often say to me, you know, are your dogs dangerous? And I kind of think, well, if my dog's 
if I thought my dogs were going to bite your child, my dogs would not be putting their nose into your child's face. Trust me on this. Um, and, you know, I, I'm keeping an eye on the child's body language and my dog's body. Now, I'm very fortunate. My dogs um, have had – oh, Brendan, you're back. Uh, my dogs have had – little children jabbing them in the ribs, pulling their ears, uh, pulling their tails, and they really uh, don't seem to mind. They just nudge them with their noses and push them away. But absolutely, I, I can see there's sometimes potential for problems there. Um, and Giselle points out here, yeah, poison is another reason. Um, she says that neighbours like to leave poison in smaller parks. I've definitely heard about that, and I've also heard about barking dogs on terraces um, having kind of poison meat thrown out to them. You, you have to wonder what is going through people's minds there, although I do sympathise with the problem that I've had noisy dog neighbours. Um, actually, Giselle, one of the big problems we have here is people poisoning rats. Uh, so people put out poison... As, Pigeons, sorry. So people put out poison for the pigeons, rat poison for the pigeons, uh, and of course some of that gets onto the street, and of course some of it poisons the pigeons who die and then get investigated by dogs. So, yeah, lots of danger. Lots yeah, of Ali, danger. I just heard you, and apologies there. Uh, obviously, uh, internet issues here just um, completely went uh, on me. Uh, failed for whatever, two or three minutes. But... Um, like, yeah, the, the one bugbear from, from my side of things, like, as I said, I'm not a dog owner, um, but lots of nice dogs. I've met your dogs, and I get on well with them. They seem to like me as well. Um, but I go on long walks here, not in the city per se, but in the nearby areas, which has happened of late, and rather aggressive dogs just roaming. Through. Like, these aren't stray dogs. They're not wild dogs. They are dogs that are owned by people. But they just let yeah. them roam freely and they're very aggressive up to the point where a couple of months ago i was bitten by one uh, up on the yeah, hills I, I, I mentioned that yeah um yeah and your bite wasn't so bad you didn't need to go to no. hospital did you yeah oh no 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 thankfully not. second second time uh, i was actually bitten in bogota uh, a few years ago as well by a dog and the owner was she was very sorry in fairness because i was saying like you know if this kind of thing happens and in Ireland, uh, they'd be putting the dog down once it draws a bit of blood. Now, again, it wasn't a wasn't a, a bad bite, but um, she brought me back and she um, sewed my my tracksuit bottoms back where there was a hole, and she gave me iodine and she showed me the papers where the dog, had, you know, got all his um, rabies shots and all that kind of stuff. So, like, fair play to her for doing that. Uh, where I was bitten only a few weeks ago, they were less. Uh, bothered about me and more like going well why were you we walking on the road so, oh I didn't realize that I couldn't walk on the road but there is this kind of idea with some people who just kind of yeah I have my dog and it can do whatever it wants to do and I'm not really that responsible for it as long as it's alive yeah no definitely and and lots of people will get I mean we've had trouble uh, here there was a large aggressive pit bull um, about a year, no, two years ago now, um, that would regularly go up to other dogs and um, uh, and be quite aggressive, that was just walking around. Um, in the end, uh, uh, we got the police to go around and speak to the owner, and they uh, left their house pretty shortly afterwards. But, um, yeah, you do get some bad owners, um, especially with pit bulls. Now, I'm, I mean, I must be clear, the massive majority of pit bull owners that I come across are wonderful, wonderful dog owners. Often people who have adopted uh, former fighting animals, really, or, or animals that have been abandoned because they won't fight or, or whatever. So a lot of them are really, really good. But that tiny minority really cause problems, um, you know, which, which can be a problem. Yeah, uh, now, I guess moving away, people just writing in as well, Giselle telling about her, her dad, um, like almost being killed by a, by a German shepherd, which sounds scary. And, and, and as I said, I don't tend to find aggressive dogs in Bogota a problem. It's more, as Jonathan mentions, when you're cycling on country roads or out walking. Like I walked to, uh, I had a 17 kilometer walk to La Calera on Sunday, uh, as is my want, but uh, I came across a few, uh, like, 
you kind of know if they're barking and wagging their tail, you're kind of going, well, this isn't too bad. But if they come out racing at you, then you're kind of going, God, because you know that there's a whole idea that, no, you're meant to stand strong and tall and don't show fear. So it's easier said than done when a dog, yeah. Pretty, and, and um, you know, as I'm sure was the case with Giselle's father, it certainly was with my attack in Hardin. A straight attack. You know, there's there's no bark warning, just boff straight uh, straight out, and and they can do damage. You know, um, even in my building, uh, my downstairs neighbours got bitten by one of the other uh, building residents' dogs. And again, I I just find things like that bizarre. Like you say, if we were in Ireland or if we were in the UK, you know, that would just be a dead dog. And that would be the end of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very sadly, actually, just this week in Ireland, a three-year-old girl was killed by a, a terrier. Now, it was a family dog. But, uh, you know, you, you do hear those terrible I'll stories I'll also point out, well. J- Jonathan Hemming's point about cyclists, and, and as a cyclist, this is something I've come across before, it's particularly dangerous if you're descending. Uh, you can more or less deal with it on... Um, you know, on flat roads, but descending, you know, a dog jumps out at you, they've misjudged your speed, you know, you hit that dog, and you could easily fly off the bars and do some serious mischief. Yeah, well, actually, I'm, I'm kind of smiling here because this wasn't even a vicious dog, but when I was close to La Calera, and it's a popular route that I kind of took this back way for cyclists, and they were coming down a, a relatively steep hill, but it wasn't an aggressive dog, it was just an old dopey dog, and it, and it decided to stand up at the most inopportune time when this cyclist was coming, and he really had to brake hard, like he had a very good bike with kind of those good disc brakes, so it worked out well for him, or you know, he was safe enough in the end, but I kind of thought that could have gone horribly wrong, uh, it is true. Um, G- Giselle, if someone gets very hurt, they also, ah, okay. Nobody, right, she's just saying that nobody reports these issues. That's the thing. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah no, the, the police didn't care in the slightest when I was um, uh, when I was bitten. You know, the, the, the following day, I popped, you know, I happened to be walking past the police station. So I just popped in and mentioned it to the police officers. And they just could not have cared less. Yeah. By the way, okay, let, let's end on a positive note, though, as, as we try to do on this. Uh, we've got three minutes Listen left. Positive. One thing that people may not be aware of, you'll see a lot of uh, adverts for apartments and different things, and they'll say no mascotas, no no pets right. allowed. But it's a constitutional right, Holly, to have a dog in this country, isn't that right? Uh, it's a Bogota. It's, it's a Bogota oh, thing. Oh, a one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can't stop people from having pets officially. I mean, obviously lots of, um, lots of signs will say no pets, but that is technically illegal. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, okay. um, it's actually I'll end on an even more positive note, uh, Brendan, just to say, um, I think the vast majority of, um, dog owners in Bogota are very good dog owners. There's certainly very few dogs here, I think, that are maltreated. I don't think that's as common as it is, let's say, in England, where there are a lot of dogs left at home for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Okay. Uh, of course, you do have that strange phenom- phenomenon, as you mentioned, about the dogs on roofs or in balconies. Uh, you always see, but we, may, <laughs> we kind of mentioned that about quirky things in Bogota or in Colombia in a previous episode. But even, Ali, you may not be aware of this, uh, well, there's one quick thing I was going to mention. It's quite popular here. Well, I'm only judging this on, on offices that I know, but when I worked at DDB Worldwide Columbia, the marketing agency, it was, you know, a dog-friendly company. So very regularly, uh, colleagues would have their dogs at work. It's kind of fine, oh. although it reminded... Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah wouldn't assume, I would never assume that I couldn't. I mean, I don't assume always, I certainly don't assume that I definitely can take my dogs in somewhere, but also I'm very much, I'm continually surprised at the amount of restaurants, bars, shops that have no problem with dogs coming in at all. Okay. One final thing, though, Ali, because you may not be aware of this, but there might be, you know, a, a TV production looking for Huskies. And I remember being an extra on a set, I can't remember what the production was uh, going back a few years ago, but there was a dog in it and the dog was getting paid 300,000 pesos a day while the normal extras were getting paid uh, 80,000 a day. So your dogs could uh, could become movie stars or at least telenovela stars if they're yeah. looking for huskies. Do you, do you think it could not be lazy? 
Do you think you could listen to people? Hey, eh? <laughs> we, uh, we, we, we had a rather pleasant incident today of uh, eating up some vomited bones. So we, they found some bones that had been vomited, presumably by another dog, uh, and decided to go and eat that. To the shock of a young child playing football nearby who immediately started retching himself. Okay, well, look, guys, we're, we're at time um, here. Thanks uh, for all of you for getting involved. Uh, there's a lot more we could as ever talk about dogs and bog at that. And, it, and, of course, there are other animals. Uh, you've kind of got animal farmer, the zoo in Bogota, where Ollie is, dogs, cats, fish, uh, pigeons as well, although he's not too fond of uh, those. They're, they're, <laughs> yeah. Guy, until next week, all the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> I think our producers <laughs> fall asleep. I, Usually I, we get it. I was about to say, I didn't, I didn't see it. I was, I was Sorry, wondering yeah. if I missed the time thing there. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe not. Well, we can talk for another. Uh, maybe he's giving me the time that I missed for the two minutes where I was off, uh, whatever it was. Okay. That was a bit awkward. You, yeah, you should be do. <laughs> uh, yeah, Giselle um, mentions cats there. I, I would like to point out, you know, uh, we are definitely cat friendly as well. Just, um, just today is, you know, we tend to find that uh, if we spread the bases too thin, we end up, um, yeah, uh, exactly. we, we end up uh, sort of skipping past stuff. But yeah, also, I, I was, go on. Well, I was going to say, I just think there's more work to a dog. Like, if you're owning a dog in the city, there's a lot more to do. But that's cats very is true. kind of a bit more relaxed. Yeah, uh, that's the way I look at it. Cats rule. Angela, um, there's um, a meme or whatever you want to call it, this joke going around, well, it's been for years, but if you go up and types of cat, but type that in in Google, types of cat joke in English, um, and see what you get, and you'll get a, an image of all the various types of cats, and they'll all have one particular name. Ali, do you know what I'm on about there? I don't. Is it something like okay. master or something, or lord or, or god or something? No, no, no. It's just like a poster of all the various type of cats, you know, well, you know, not all of them, but maybe about 60. And they all have one name. It begins with a C and ends with a T, but it's uh, not three letters, it's four. <laughs> yes, that I can imagine. Yeah. There's a great yeah. thing about uh, one of my favorite. Um, one of my favorite things about dogs and cats is um, somebody's made the best zones to stroke. And on the dog, it just goes, this is great. This is amazing. This is fantastic. Every area on its body just says, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And then on the cat, it just says, don't touch me here. Don't touch me here. Don't touch me here. Until there's <laughs> one little bit just by the tail where they, where they like to be. Um, uh, well, it, I, I think the difference is with cats is that it's kind of, it's on their terms. You engage with them on their terms. Whereas with dogs, it's like, you know, they just want all the time. Come on, no, you know, I want to I wanna, I wanna play, rub me and do all that kind of stuff. And cats are like, yeah, I'm not bothered. And whenever, whenever, whenever I want to, I'll let you know. Or I'll come and sit on your knee when I want to. But don't shoulder. pick me up. With me, it's, it's usually the shoulder. Um, oh, okay. I've, I've, I've had to give quite a few classes with a cat just kind of on my shoulder, and I'll be going, I'll sort of be doing this and saying to the students, but she wants to sit on my shoulder. Um, she's sitting on my shoulder. That's that's the end of that. We're not, um, you know, I'm not I'm not telling yeah. the cat she can't sit somewhere just for a class. That's that's not going to happen. Um, but yeah, there's kind of something comforting though about when, well, when a cat comes and sits on my knee, I have to say, there, there's a tienda nearby here where the owner has a cat and sometimes wanders into the tienda and seems to like to sit on my knee, uh, in particular, my knees, I should say, in particular, more than anybody else's. Um, but it's kind of, sometimes it's kind of nice, okay, just, yeah, you can, you can sit there for a while, it's fine, I don't mind. They are um, very cute, well, and they, they purr. I would say that's one of... You know, I, I had dogs when I was young, but I never had cats, and I don't really know still exactly what I'm doing with the cat. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the best thing about cats, Brendan, they purr. It's really amazing. Dogs don't purr. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's really nice. Well, I, I guess they have, 
dog does wag its tail. It, it does show appreciation as well. Again, guys, well, we're waiting for our producer to wake up. And, and the reason is uh, why we want to stay here is because Ollie and, and, uh, and I usually have a little bit of a chat after the show. So we're just waiting for the producer to take us off air so we can continue on this um, medium. But if, if um, guys, if you're still watching, send us uh, suggestions as well for topics you want us uh, to talk about. We're always uh, keen yeah. For, for what more what could we discuss in upcoming shows? We're trying. Yeah. We're hopefully going to be getting a football expert in next week. Fingers crossed. If he's not too busy. Yeah, because obviously we were talking at the start of this show, Copa America. But even even the Euros for the expats that are here and want to watch it, like. You know, talking about places to go and watch games and things like that, um, and try and get our uh, our continental friends. Uh, they're still your friends on the continent, Ali, aren't they? Even though you've left. Oh yes. Well, we always got on with Swiss people. You know, they've never been part of the EU. We always got okay. on with the Norwegians. Who doesn't <laughs> like Norwegian? I don't really know any Norwegians, I have to say, so I can't, can't really, don't think I've ever, do I know any Norwegians? That's a very good question. Put me on the spot there, not sure. But anyway, yeah, so football, I'm not sure, it's probably nobody, they've all gone to bed at this stage, as our producer seems to have um, fallen asleep as well, <laughs> whatever's happened. Yeah, I don't know, he says, know. He says the light, um, the, the electricity's gone out. Um, oh, he's saying that, ah, you're writing to him uh, on, on the yeah. old... WhatsApp machine. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah. yeah. Now he's ready. Okay, guys. Oh, there he is. Okay. There <laughs> Until we go. Next week. Ciao. Bye.